for those of you who don't really believe in Jesus Christ, for those of you who think he's a fairy tale, he's fake news, one thing you can't control is what happens before the event. And there are people who made a recording who prophesied about the Messiah. And I'm going to read that real quick. It's just one sentence, but I love it. It's from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Hmm. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, that says it right there in a nutshell, as far as, yes, he's been prophesied throughout the Bible. We're going to go to Luke chapter 24 now, and I'm going to read the story. I want you to hear it. I want you to take the time to hear the word of God. Because a lot of times we want to hear bang, bang, shoot them up. We want to see all these fancy movies with all these action heroes and all that. But your hero is right here. And it's not a lot of action, but it's a lot of pain. But there's a victory at the end. And I want you to hear it. Please take the time to listen. Even if you know the story, hear it once again. God's word is alive. Listen. And this is Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Now, this is what I want to share with that. Jesus, they had just gone through this horrible orde ordeal of watching their Lord and Savior, their Messiah, die on the cross. Why did he die? He died for us so that we could be forgiven for sin. The penalty we were to pay for sin, he paid it. He paid it all through all that he suffered, the humiliation, the kicking, the beating, the slapping, ripping of hair off his beard, the, the tearing of his back open from the whips that they beat him with, the stripes on his back. The Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. All those scars on his back, like you've seen in the movies with slave days, where they beat the slaves mercilessly with the whips. And those whips had shards on them because they wanted to cut the skin open. They wanted to intensify the pain. That's how cruel people are. And Jesus created these people with his own hand. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, capitalized. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word. Everything that was made was made by him. So listen to this. When you hear the fact that Jesus made everything, that Jesus was in the beginning and that he was the word, that he was God, that's what the Bible says. And the word was God. That tells you right there. What he did was he lowered himself. He humbled himself to suffer by the hands of the people he created himself. That's some serious humbling right there. Because all he had to do was inhale. All he had to do was think, blink, speak, whatever. And they could have all dropped like dead flies. But he knew there had to be, by his program, there had to be a sacrificial lamb that was pure, unblemished, and holy. And he was the only one who qualified. So he lowered himself and placed himself into the form of man in flesh and died the sin of sinners for us in our place. Now, let's continue. But. He didn't stay in the, in the tomb, did he? Verse two, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and they had entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living 
among the dead. Don't we do that? Don't we seek the living among the dead? Don't we seek the living in the alcohol, in the weed, in the crack cocaine, in the joint? Don't we seek uh, the living among the dead? We seek life out of broken and sorry relationships. We seek life out of abusive relationships. We seek life out of all kind of horrible uh, extractions like, like trying to get money out of chance by gambling, 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 but we lose, lose, lose. We win a few times to keep us coming back. We have all these different drugs of choices. We're seeking the living among the dead. We're looking around people who aren't about nothing, trying to be accepted, trying to be liked by them. We spend our lives scratching and digging, trying to make something out of our lives, but we can't do that because life comes from God. Purpose comes from God meaningfulness comes from God. You hear me? Satisfaction comes from God. So let's continue reading. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Verse six, and he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the son of man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. See, the difference between Jesus and every other prophet out there is that he rose from the dead. He will never die again. Let me go down fast forward. There comes a point where he opens their eyes. All right. <laughs> now, verse 35, and they told the things that were done in the way and how he was known of them breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the middle of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, supposing that they had seen a spirit, or in our day we call it a ghost. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands, my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Now one thing about it, baby, ghosts cannot eat. Spirits cannot eat. Listen to this. And they gave him a piece of royal fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. See, Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. For example, Moses, when God judged Israel for their murmuring and complaining, he sent the, the, uh, what the Bible refers to as fiery serpents. They sent the fiery serpents to bite the Israelites and they were dropping like flies. They were sick and dying slowly and painfully and Moses inter interceded for them. So God instructed him to create a brass serpent, put it on a pole, stick it on a hill and instruct the people, when you look at the brass serpent, that's the only way you're going to be healed. Now, why would they have to look at a brass serpent? instead of an angel, a dove, a flower, a sun, whatever. No, the brass serpent represented Jesus Christ. That was prophetic. The Lord revealed that to me. The brass serpent represented Jesus Christ, the serpent who had bitten nobody, who had done nobody any harm, was up on a pole on a hill like Jesus up on a cross on a hill. Mm -hmm. And he was in the form of sinful flesh, but he had committed no sin. The serpent was in the form of these fiery serpents, but he had hurt nobody. And the people had to look at the brass serpent in order to be healed. That's a correlation between Jesus. See, all this stuff stems from the beginning of the Old Testament all the way through. It's all about Jesus. It's all prophesied and symbolic of Jesus. Even the wilderness wanderings, everything is symbolic. The flood. It's symbolic of baptism. I'm telling you, there's so many symbols in the Old Testament that refer to Jesus and what he's about. Now, listen, 
I'm just going to go and fast forward. He ate. They were astonished. And what did he do? He disappeared. And he let them know he'd meet them in Galilee. So when he did meet them in Galilee and he talked to them and he said, wait, abide here until you have been endued with power from on high. Then the Lord resurrected him off the ground and raised him up as the rapture would take place. Right. And he's going up in the air in their sight. They see him as he disappears in the clouds. And then they went back. Now, listen, listen, listen. What we don't realize is there's power in the resurrection. There's so much symbolism in what the resurrection represents. You see, when a person is resurrected from the dead, there is total healing. There is a renewal of every cell, every fiber of their body. And what Jesus did through his resurrection, is we didn't only get saved and forgiven and granted mercy and pardon through his death and burial, but through his resurrection, we got renewal of life. We are a new creature. Behold, all things are become new. You know that scripture, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what happens to us only because of the resurrection. Here's why. Once he was resurrected within a certain amount of time in the fullness of God's time, when the people were in the upper room in Acts chapter two, they were praising, worshiping God on one accord. Boy, how much power would our church have, the church of Christ all around the world? How much power would we have if we were on one accord in true love? Mm. So what happens is while they're praising God, the Holy Spirit, remember Jesus said, I go away, but I must go away to send you the comforter. So he sends his Holy Spirit to, to engulf us to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, fill us with the Holy Spirit, empower us by the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does, he changes our nature. So instead of desiring the old and desiring the sinful and the self-destruction and the dysfunction, all the things that are non-productive, the Holy Spirit changes our no to a yes. The Holy Spirit changes our yes to a no. There was a time when a lady was trying to talk me into staying out here so I could take care of my father. As far as I was concerned, she might as well have cussed me out because that was the furthest thing from my mind. But once I got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, guess who was begging God to let her show her father her love for all the love he gave me? Me. I was constantly asking God while my father was in the hospital, please let him live long enough to come home. I will take care of him morning, noon, and night. I want to get him saved, Lord. Please let him come home. I had a want to that wasn't there before. Why? The Holy Spirit. When Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit in time came down. And because of his resurrection, we are able to become, it's a slow process, to become the sons and daughters of God. Empowered with love, empowered with all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to live with stinking thinking for the rest of your life. You don't have to live with a nasty attitude for the rest of your life. You don't have to walk around flinching, oversensitive, and hurt all the time for the rest of your life. I know it takes time to get that healing. It's not an overnight success for most of us. But the more we pursue God, the quicker we get the change. The quicker we get the change from being filled with the Holy Spirit, the quicker we grow. The quicker we grow, the further in life we can go. So it doesn't matter where you started. That's not the point. 
God will use your experience from whence you came. But the fact that you have a destiny, you were born with a purpose, all of that starts to come into focus once you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? God opens your eyes and you can see things you weren't able to see before. You can understand things you weren't able to understand before. Revelation begins to come to you. Love floods your heart and you love people you never thought you could love. So for those of you born again Christians who are still prejudiced, for those of you born again Christians who are still snotty and high-minded, for those of you born again Christians who look down on the homeless, who don't want to touch the unclean thing because you're too clean, holy, and perfect, baby, you better go back to the manufacturer and find out if you got that oil because you may not be filled with the Holy Ghost. With God comes love. With God comes peace. With God comes joy, joy unspeakable, full of glory. The joy of the Lord is our strength. With God comes the anointing, satisfaction. With God comes life, life worth living. With God comes purpose. With God comes self-control. So the Holy Spirit comes and rids you of all the can't help it. But it happens over time. Don't look for an overnight success. A lot of you want a magic wand experience. That's not the way it is. It took Jesus time to climb that hill. It took him time being beaten, having his, his beard ripped. It took time going through all that. We are not going to get our change overnight. Boom, just like that. Life happens, and as life happens, what he did on Calvary, the power that comes from his resurrection gives us the power to deal. See, a lot of you don't have coping skills. Lynn and I were talking about that the other day. A lot of you don't have coping skills, and when you don't have coping skills, life just seems like it's, it's so overwhelming, you just can't bear up under the weight, under the load. It hurts. It's too hard. But when you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, he makes it easier. That's why Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So, for example, because of the power of, res of his resurrection, of the power of his Holy Spirit. See, we must be acquainted with the power of his resurrection and with the fellowship of his suffering, which means we gonna go through some stuff, y'all. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're not exempt. The fellowship of his suffering tells us right there, we're gonna go through some stuff. But here's the difference. You can go by yourself, do it your own way. That's fine, Wendy. But let me tell you this. I'm talking about Wendy. You have it your way. But listen to this. When you have the Holy Spirit and you have sweet communion with God and Lynn gets on my last nerve or Pat makes me angry or, 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 or Peggy makes me want to throw something upside her head, whatever. What happens is I have the moment and the, the presence of mind by the Holy Spirit that's in me and the love that he shed in my heart. I say, okay, Lord, Lord, take this anger out. Take it out. Help me deal with this. Take the depression out. Take the hurt out. I don't have to succumb to the beggarly elements of this sinful world. When I have you and the power of your Holy Spirit and your resurrection dwelling in me, you don't have to deal with things on your own. You have help. You have what the Bible refers to as a paraclete. That means the Holy Spirit is right there by your side. He's in your heart. He abides within you. He's around you. He's, he's working on your behalf, interceding for you in prayer as well. Because what's in you is God himself. 
The Holy Spirit is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is what dwells in you. See, God stacked the deck in your favor because what he did was he said, these folks ain't going to be able to do this. You know, I got to empower them. I need their hearts to be circumcised. I need their minds to have the mind of Christ. I need them to have a whole different way of thinking, a whole different way of talking, a whole different way of walking, a whole different way of living, a whole different way of being without taking away their personality and their crazy quirkiness. But God empowers us. He stacks the deck in our favor and he works on our behalf to be able to become the sons and daughters of God over time. As Pastor Cushman used to say, you will know as you follow on to know. It's the following on. It's the journey. It's the process of mortifying the deeds of the flesh. It's the process of praying away your nasty pride. It's a process of asking God for the ability to do what you may not want to do, which is forgive. And he will do it. It's a process of being merciful. It's a process of learning by watching how Jesus did it, how to be kind to the mean, how to be loving to the hateful, how to be merciful to the crude. Yes, how to be wise when you're around the foolish. God knows how to help you. But you have to have the presence of mind to ask him for that help. Because I'm going to tell you right now, even though we have that power of resurrection working in us, there are times our flesh is still very much alive. You can see it. We're here walking in flesh. But listen, because of the flesh, there are times we don't want to forgive. There are times we want to cuss and suck out, put them in their place. There are times we want to ream them out, put their their business out on, on Facebook and everywhere to make them look bad to the public and just just slander them and, and get them back for what they did to you. But that's not how God works. See, that right there, vengeance, unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, gossip, backbiting, slandering, strife, violence, cussing folks out, slapping them upside the head, kicking them, punching them whenever you feel like it, disrespecting people in public. All of that is seeking the living among the dead. You expect to get a high off of it. You expect to nut up on that baby and feel great about yourself because you, you you made sure they heard you, baby. You made sure they felt the pain. But that's not God's way. That's the way of death. You want to learn how to be better at that? You go on and consult with the devil, the demons, and sit in the graveyard all your life. Because that's basically what you're doing, living in the gutter. But when you deal with the things of God, you love no matter what. You forgive no matter what. You're willing to stay in communication and communion and unity no matter what they did. You're not going to write them off your list and totally cut them out of your life unless your safety is at risk, unless they are such bad news that they have too bad of an influence on you. There are times that you must cut things out of your life, but not out of spite, not out of anger. I'm not going to take time with this, but just in case someone else has a word, I'm going to cut it short. But I want you to know, you, if you are living in Christ, you can rise higher, 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 higher. And as long as you're staying in communion with God, God will help you, help you, help you, help you. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit came because Jesus rose from the dead. God bless you. Amen.